Hi, everybody that's joining. We're just waiting uh, for uh, all the folks to get in and we will get started shortly. Just going to wait a few minutes to uh, make sure everyone is, uh, is in the Zoom and uh, we'll get started in uh, yeah, just a minute or two, everyone. Thanks for, thanks for coming. See, someone's asking if uh, you, if we have you all muted. Uh, I believe so, yes. Okay, well, it looks like uh, the numbers are kind of leveling off here. So let me just make sure. Um, what time is it? Yeah, okay, so I'm gonna uh, get started. Um, all right. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, this webinar, uh, Sealed Packages and Preservation Framing, um, presented by the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts in Philadelphia, a regional uh, paper conservation lab, uh, for those of you who don't know. Um, uh, my name is Zach Delorto. I am the manager of housing and framing at the Conservation Center. Um, uh, I've held that position for just about seven years now. Um, and been at the center in total for about nine years. Um, but yeah, uh, before we get started, uh, just wanted to kind of let you all know how it's gonna go. Um, uh, I'm going to give, uh, give the talk and um, then uh, at the end we'll have a Q&A session uh, where you can, uh, can ask questions. Um, but then also, uh, you know, while the talk is going on, um, feel free to, um, to ask questions uh, in the chat and um, 
our moderator Leah will be there um, so uh, she can answer whatever questions that she's able to, uh, you know, especially technical uh, questions, technical issues any of you might be having, um, and she'll forward those along to me if, you know, if it's necessary. Um, but, uh, and then hopefully some of those questions I'll probably just have to get to uh, at the end. Um, all right, so sealed packages and preservation framing. Um, first off, I uh, just wanted to talk a little bit about preservation framing and um, what, what that is. Um, definition as defined by the Library of Congress, uh, preservation framing describes materials and methods designed to limit environmental risks to the displayed object by using chemically stable materials. It is non-invasive and reversible. Now, these two terms, uh, non-invasive and reversible, are uh, you know, real mantras that we go by. Um, and so throughout this talk, I will be uh, trying to uh, you know, hit on those as much as possible and, and, and really uh, through repetition, um, you know, kind of uh, make make those terms apply as much as I can. Um, and the chemically stable materials, what we're going to be talking a lot about the different materials, both in just preservation framing in general, but and then but also specifically um, with the sealed package um, as we make them at uh, at the center, um, and then just generally. Um, so preservation framing is not a substitute for conservation. Um, conservation treatment is an intervention to repair and prolong an object's life. Uh, whereas preservation framing uh, maintains the object's current condition and is intended to prevent change, changes that can occur in ambient condition. So, Conservation is an intervention, a very carefully considered intervention carried out by someone who um, is very well trained and uh, aware of the various uh, issues uh, with that intervention. Whereas preservation is, is about uh, maintaining uh, the, the condition um, and prevent, and really to prevent change. Um, so, oftentimes when we're talking uh, about preservation framing, um, it's necessary to have a discussion first about conservation um, and to, to determine whether or not, you know, it's the right step to move on to preservation without, you know, conservation or whether conservation is needed before we uh, move on. Uh, to preservation. Um, some of the materials and methods that, uh, that we, we use in preservation framing. Um, again, the non-invasive and reversible methods. Um, over on the right, we have some examples here of some methods, uh, mounting methods specifically. Um, in the upper left, that image is of someone attaching uh, some mulberry paper hinges uh, to directly to an object on paper using wheat starch paste. Um, and so uh, that is generally considered to be the, the most acceptable uh, way to adhere uh, mounting materials to directly to an artwork is with wheat starch paste because of the reversibility and the non-invasive nature uh, of those materials. Um, on the right, we have uh, another mounting technique that's, uh, these are called edge strips. So um, edge strips are an example of a non-adhesive mounting technique. Um, so you can see around, around this photograph, there are strips of paper that are then uh, 
attached to a, a backing mat um, to mount this photograph. Um, so, and then again on the bottom, we have an example of a uh, paper corner, another non-adhesive mounting technique. Um, so again, non-invasive, uh, in the case of the, the wheat starch paste uh, hinge reversible, in the case of these non-adhesive mountings, uh, I mean, very reversible in that they are not even attached. Um, and speaking of, of the materials, uh, chemically stable materials that we're talking about, uh, a term that often gets uh, used or thrown around in framing especially is the word archival. Um, and that's something that we try to stay away from um, in preservation framing because unfortunately archival does not really have uh, any defined parameters. Um, so instead what we want to talk about is the actual makeup of the materials, what the materials are made of and um, how those materials are chemically stable. Um, because unfortunately archival is often misused. It's often, uh, we see it being applied to things that do not meet the standards of preservation framing. Um, so we're going to be going into all these materials as we go, as we talk about the sealed package, but we're, some of the materials we're, we're talking about here, uh, mat board, uh, backing board, glazing, mounting materials, uh, tapes, which never directly on an artwork do we uh, use tapes, but we do use tape uh, for some other things and uh, they should be, uh, all of these things should be considered. Um, now I wanna talk a little bit about the various factors of deterioration um, that are, you know, really the, the enemies, especially of uh, objects on paper, works on paper. Um, and there's basically five different uh, factors that we uh, need to uh, consider. Uh, relative humidity slash temperature, those two are usually grouped together. Um, light, pollutants, pests, and mold. Um, so we'll go through them one by one here. Uh, relative humidity or RH and temperature. Um, so the ideal RH for paper objects is 50% with a plus or minus 5% range uh, of acceptability. Um, and the ideal temperature for paper objects is 18 degrees Celsius with plus or minus two degrees Celsius. Uh, so for all of us in the United States, <laughs> that's, you know, mid 60s, uh, low to upper mid 60s is, uh, is really the ideal temperature for, uh, for objects on paper. Now, paper objects reach uh, an equilibrium with the RH and temperature of their environment over time. Uh, and this is something that's important to uh, take into consideration when we're talking about the sealed package because a sealed package is essentially an environment. It's a, an enclosed environment. So uh, we'll talk about that as we go as well. Um, and rapid changes in RH and temperature can cause a lot of problems with paper, uh, distortion in the paper substrates, flaking of media and hinge or mount failure. So, this is probably something that a lot of you have seen with, you know, paper cockling uh, uh, and things like that. Uh, the cockling of paper, especially, that's a, a really common one. Paper is very sensitive to uh, fluctuations in RH. Uh, additionally, RH over 65% will result in microbiological activity, uh, making mold growth possible. Um, so. We'll talk a little bit about that with mold in a second, but um, that's another consideration with RH and how RH and mold actually are tied. Um, light, 
light is another of the main uh, enemies of object on paper. Uh, there are three types of light, um, generally speaking, <laughs> infrared, visible, and ultraviolet light. Um, and generally, when we are talking about the risks, visible and ultraviolet light are the two that we're, we're really talking about. But infrared light does, it generates heat and can cause condensation in unsealed housing. Um, so that is a, a consideration, um, you know, causing condensation affecting the RH uh, can, can cause, uh, you know, a, a issues associated with RH. Um, but the visible and UV light uh, can cause lots and lots of uh, problems with uh, orbs on paper, weakening, brittleness, discoloration of paper and of pigments, and the big one, uh, fading. Um, so I'm sure a lot of you have experienced fading either in a framed artwork or even, you know, a magazine that you leave out in the sun, you know, on a table that gets direct sunlight um, uh, will fade very quickly. So um, that is definitely a consideration. Um, pollutants or air pollution, um, which can be broken down uh, into uh, first gaseous pollutants, uh, environmental um, uh, gaseous pollutants such as ozone, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxide, and internal uh, gaseous pollutants from degrading materials that contain acid, formaldehyde, chlorine, sulfur, lignin, and plasticizers. Uh, and then the other type, uh, particulates. Uh, particulates are tiny particles of solids or liquids suspended in gas. Um, they come from things like audio, auto exhaust, industrial smokestacks, and unless you are in a building that has a very uh, advanced uh, filtration system, they penetrate easily into the interiors of buildings. So unfortunately, we live amongst uh, particulates. Um, so uh, pollutants, uh, both gaseous and particulate uh, pollutants, uh, increase the deterioration of paper. Um, uh, in, in addition to that, particulates also um, can help trap moisture in paper and can mechanically damage pigments and photoemulsions as well. And pests. Um, when we talk about pests, we are talking primarily about insects. Um, some insects feed on paper. Um, such as silverfish, cockroaches, book lice. Uh, we have some photos. Sorry for everybody if this is traumatizing <laughs> to see some of these, uh, but uh, a silverfish, a cockroach, and a book lice there. Um, and on the right here, we have a conservator removing insect droppings or specks from paper. Uh, House flies. While they do not feed on paper, they, uh, their specks cause acidification. Acidification causes the degradation of paper. So uh, another uh, factor of deterioration. Um, and now mold. Uh, as I said before, mold can grow in sustained relative humidity of 65% or higher. Um, now mold causes staining and degradation of cellulose and sizing agents in paper, uh, resulting in the weakening or even destruction of paper. Um, on the right here, we have, uh, this is the uh, verso or the back of, a, of, a, a, of an artwork that has, has a lot of damage, but here in the middle here is a, uh, uh, this purplish stain, that is a stain uh, from mold that has been remediated, but, uh, but the stain remains. Um, now, mold and insects both also uh, present a, a sort of unique issue in that if they aren't dealt with, they will continue to get worse and worse and worse. Um, 
some of these other issues, you know, if you have something that is uh, being exposed to light and is getting damaged, if you take it out of the light, a, a relatively simple, you know, uh, fix, it will not continue uh, to, to fade, whereas, you know, mold and insects require, you know, a, a serious intervention in order to, uh, um, to fix them. <laughs> All right, so that brings us to sealed packages. Um, a sort of basic uh, definition of a sealed package, uh, it's a sealed enclosure that creates a microclimate around an object. Um, so we'll talk a little more about the microclimate as we go. Um, uh, but then also its main purpose is to protect against all of those factors of deterioration that we had just spoken about uh, before. Um, and so uh, a sealed package really um, is often case the best the best way to uh, to prevent those issues or to mitigate those issues I should say um, a little brief history of sealed packages um, you know we can go back pretty far uh, mid 19th century to some uh, earliest sealed packages um, which are not quite like the, the sealed packages we're doing now, but it was a, a realization that uh, protecting artworks from, uh, from some of these factors of deterioration uh, would be beneficial uh, to those artworks. So in the mid 19th century, uh, you saw uh, Passepartout uh, being used. So that would be a matted artwork. Um, glazed with a piece of glass at the top on the face and then sealed at the edges with a gummed paper tape uh, to keep keep out you know not was not creating anything like a, a total seal but you know trying to keep out as many of those factors of deterioration as they could um, you know jumping well ahead into the 1960s um, at the Tate Gallery in the UK, um, there was a Perspex sandwich mount and then soon thereafter in the 70s, the acrylic sandwich mount at the Library of Congress. These are both basically a matted artwork with a piece of acrylic on the front and back. So sandwiched in between acrylic and then sealed with tape at the edges as well to uh, again mitigate all of those factors of deterioration and these were for for their you know vast collections at the Tate and the, and the Library of Congress. Um, moving forward to 1994 the microclimate sealed package which is the sort of the current sealed package when I say sealed package that is generally what, what we're talking about the microclimate sealed package was developed by Hugh Fibbs at the National Gallery of Art. Um, and then in 1996, CCAHA adopted uh, Fibbs's microclimate sealed package design. Um, and with a few tweaks along the way, that's essentially what we are still doing uh, to this day at uh, the Conservation Center is the sealed package developed by Hugh Fibbs uh, at the National Gallery. So, um, moving into the construction of sealed packages, uh, the sealed package, the version of the sealed package that we make at the Conservation Center. Um, a sealed package consists of four main components, um, the matted mounted artwork, backing board, glazing, and vapor barrier. Now, over on the right, we have uh, an image here of, it's a 3D image of a kind of broken down sealed package and frame with all the components so you can see um, everything involved. And this, is, this has some extra uh, 
components besides the main four components. Um, we'll get into talking about some variations on the basic design, um, but they all generally function the same way. Um, and then the other thing that um, some folks maybe don't realize when we're talking about uh, these sealed packages is that they fasten into a frame and appear identical to any other framed artwork. Um, so if you don't have much uh, experience with sealed packages, it's still very possible that you have seen a sealed package hanging on a wall somewhere and you didn't even realize it because like I said, it looks, uh, when framed, it appears identical to any other framed artwork. But uh, so this, this 3D image here has a, the image of the frame and the strainer, um, which we'll get into sort of as the last step of the construction or uh, you know, after the construction, the framing step. Uh, okay. So getting into the different layers. Uh, the first layer I want to talk about, it's the mounted artwork. Um, artwork uh, mounted into a window mat with mulberry paper hinges and wheat starch paste. Uh, it's really the most common uh, mounting that we do at the Conservation Center. Um, just a window mat with, uh, with hinges and wheat starch paste. Um, so, a little bit about the window mat. Uh, generally, the window mat is an eight ply uh, aperture mat and a four ply back mat uh, attached at the longest edge with gummed linen tape. So this image at the side here, you can see um, it's the, the aperture in the front that opens, um, opens just like a window or, actually it's kind of, it opens a little bit more like a door but it's called a window mat <laughs> regardless, I guess, because it has the, the aperture, which is like a window. Um, uh, so the window mat provides support around the edges of the artwork. Uh, generally speaking, the way that an artwork is uh, mounted into a window mat um, is what we call over matted with the, uh, the edges of the paper extending slightly beyond the, the window of the mat. Um, and so in addition to whatever mounting technique uh, you have, whether it be adhesive or non-adhesive, the, the window mat then provides additional support around the edges of the artwork to hold it in place. Um, another function of the window mat is to provide space between the artwork and the glazing. Uh, glazing refers to either glass or acrylic that goes on the face. Um, and it's very important that there is a space, a gap between the artwork and the glazing. So uh, one of the ways to achieve that is with a window mat. There are other ways. Uh, spacers is another way, which we'll, we'll talk about spacers a little later as well. Um, and as I uh, mentioned a little bit earlier, um, mounting, uh, generally, uh, mounting is either with mulberry paper hinges and wheat starch paste, that's the adhesive mounting, and, or edge strips or paper corners, uh, two different forms of non-adhesive mounting. Um, and th those three different uh, ways to mount an artwork are almost always uh, um, one of those is almost always uh, a uh, is possible. Very rarely um, do we need to uh, consider alternative mounting techniques beyond those. Um, excuse me. Uh, so, um, a little bit more about mat board. The makeup of the mat board. Um, the map boards that we generally use in our sealed packages at the Conservation Center is the Bainbridge brand uh, Art Care Alpha Rag map board. Um, that's a standard board at CCHA. Uh, the main reason being uh, because of the zeolite technology that is contained in those boards. So zeolites are, excuse me, uh, sometimes. Uh, referred to as molecular sieves 
what they do is they uh, trap pollutants on a molecular level. They pull pollutants out of a, uh, an object on paper and trap them molecularly in, their, uh, in the zeolite. Um, so when we're talking about sealing something in a microclimate, um, the, the presence of zeolites is uh, extremely beneficial. Um, in addition to that, uh, these Bainbridge uh, boards are alkaline buffered with calcium carbonate. Um, and they are, these are 100% uh, cotton rag board, uh, alkaline buffered um, map boards. Um, so generally speaking, there are three different types of map boards that uh, are uh, available that you need to be aware of. Um, the first one being that 100% cotton rag board. Um, you'll hear these boards being referred to sometimes as museum boards. Uh, they being 100% cotton rag, they are naturally acid free, so they do not acidify over time. Um, another term you'll hear is lignin free um, and uh, alkaline buffered uh, with calcium carbonate. Um, so all of these, uh, when we talk about the, the, the actual makeup of the board, all, all of these terms are, are important to, uh, to be aware of. Um, second, you have virgin alpha cellulose boards. Um, these are also often uh, described as museum boards. Um, and they have uh, been tested by the Library of Congress and are considered uh, suitable for preservation framing. However, they're not as time tested as rag boards. It's a relatively uh, new, newer technology compared to cotton rag. So um, if at all possible, um, at the Conservation Center, talk, trying to stay, stick to the, uh, the highest level of, uh, of care and preservation uh, standards we really like to stick to uh, cotton rag boards if we can, and generally we do. Uh, the third type of map board um, that you'll hear about often is acid-free board. Um, now, acid-free map board can be a little bit uh, misleading uh, because really it's probably a more suitable name would be acid-free for now map board. Um, because there's really acid-free boards um, will acidify, while they are uh, alkaline buffered, they will acidify over time. So they're really not suitable for preservation framing. Uh, they certainly have their, their, their place um, it, in a lot of retail framing. You know, if someone wants to frame a poster or something that they don't really expect to, you know, persist like in perpetuity, uh, you know, and, you know, cost is a consideration and, you know, something like that, they, they certainly have their place. They're available in a wide variety of colors and even, you know, printed designs and things like that. But uh, we really don't want to be using them in the context of preservation framing. Some variations on the basic window mat. Um, a sink mat, for example, or a deep sink. Uh, this image on the top left here, this is a sink mat where you have mat board attached to the back mat in order to uh, accommodate, let's say, a, uh, an artwork that is on a support that has some, some depth to it. So you would attach that mat board sink to the back mat in order to um, either make the artwork level, to, to make the, the backing board level with the artwork so that when that window mat opens and closes, it can close uh, safely. Or sometimes you have a, uh, maybe a warped artwork that needs some support because you don't want to, to close the window mat on 
directly on the object. So you'll have the sink so that the window mat doesn't close all the way and damage that, that artwork. Um, now this, this image on the bottom here is a close up of a deep sink. Now a deep sink is a little bit different in that it's uh, basically providing extra depth between the artwork and the glazing. Um, so at the center, we'll, we'll make deep sinks a lot for like a parchment document that is incredibly uh, sensitive to even the slightest fluctuations in humidity and can cockle quite easily. So in order to make sure that we're not having our, uh, our glazing come into contact with the artifact, we're, we're putting in a, a deep sink to, to, um, to, to have a, an extra large gap so that, so that we are uh, confident that that won't be an issue. Um, another uh, variation is a, a double-sided mat. So this is instead of uh, an aperture and a back mat, these are two aperture mats that are, are hinged together. Um, and the reason for this would be, you know, they're an artwork that has information on the verso and the recto uh, or the front and back or back and front. <laughs> um, so that's another variation. And uh, this image here is actually a, uh, a sealed package with a double-sided uh, mat. Um, so you can see sort of a finished sealed package with the double-sided matting. Um, additionally, a multi-opening window mat. Unfortunately, I, didn't, I wasn't able to get a, a good image of that, but a multi-opening window mat um, is, uh, just a mat with multiple apertures in it, usually in order to display more than one artwork in the same matting. Um, and so again, that functions very similarly to a, a basic window mat, but you're talking about, you know, two or more artworks or possibly just one artwork that has, um, you know, information and only a couple spots, but that's rare. It's usually for multiple artworks. Okay, so uh, getting moving on to the next layer uh, is the backing board. Um, the backing board is it's an additional layer behind the back mat that allows air circulation within the microclimate enclosure. So this is important because, as I said, this is a microclimate. So and we had talked about earlier how um, uh, objects on paper reach equilibrium within their climate. So the, the back, backing board allows the air circulation to happen in such a way where that equilibrium can be, uh, can be achieved. Um, some different types of backing board uh, that are used. Um, first off, uh, alkaline corrugated paperboard, or sometimes called blue board. Um, uh, this is the board, the backing board that we generally use for standard sealed packages at the Conservation Center. Um, it's an alkaline buffered uh, z with zeolites technology as well. Uh, it's a Bainbridge uh, brand board that we use. Um, so that is the primary board we use in sealed packages at the Conservation Center. Um, it's also available in a couple different thicknesses. You have the single wall and the double wall. Um, single wall can be adequate for, for small, um, very small pieces. Um, oh, and sometimes it's necessary to limit the depth of a sealed package. So single wall can be used in that case. But um, without any other, you know, factors constraining you, double wall is generally uh, the board that we, backing board we like to use. Um, another backing board we use uh, pretty frequently, it's, uh, it's called Hexamount. Um, it's a honeycomb uh, virgin alpha cellulose lignin free alkaline buffered paperboard panel. Um, we'll call it just a honeycomb panel. Um, this is used, uh, it comes in really, really large sheets. 
it, it's available in half inch and three quarter inch uh, thicknesses. So it's, it's really good for, uh, for, over, for larger pieces, oversized pieces. Um, we'll use hex amount uh, from time to time. Um, another type of backing board uh, that's suitable for sealed package is coroplast. Um, it's a corrugated polypropylene board. Um, it's uh, completely suitable for sealed packages. We tend to not use that very much at uh, the conservation center um, uh, just because we tend to use the alkaline uh, corrugated paperboard instead. It has that zeolite technology and um, the, that's just the standard uh, board that we tend to use. But Coroplast is also a perfectly suitable uh, backing board. Um, the next layer uh, is glazing. Now glazing can be either glass or acrylic. Um, but it, I'll get into it a little more. We, we almost always uh, will use, for our sealed packages, we'll use acrylic, a UV filtering, ultraviolet uh, filtering acrylic uh, on the face of the mounted artwork. Um, so ultraviolet filtering acrylic um, blocks approximately 98% of ultraviolet light. Um, is lightweight and does not shatter. That's primarily the reason that we use acrylic rather than glass is because of this feature. Um, glass provide, uh, presents a real danger to artworks because uh, of the possibility that it will shatter. Um, it shatters very easily, in fact, and the 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 danger that that presents to artwork is uh, really the determining factor that leads us to use acrylic in almost all cases instead of glass. Um, so ultraviolet filtering acrylic is available uh, aside from the ultraviolet filtering uh, coating that it has. It's also available in a variety of other, with a variety of other coatings like reflection control, uh, scratch resistant control, and anti-static uh, coatings as well. Um, the one thing uh, that no glazing provides is that none of these glazings uh, protect against damage from visible light. Um, so that is something that is a consideration that everyone uh, should, should really take into account um, when thinking about their, uh, displaying their artworks. Um, there, is, there is really, basically, if you can see it, it is being damaged by visible light <laughs> while you are viewing it. Um, so unfortunately, there's really that the only thing to, to sort of think about and say about visible light is um, you have to make a determination uh, and weigh the uh, risks and the benefits of th those effects. Um, some folks will tell you that, uh, you know, an object should really, an artwork should really only be displayed for three months of the year uh, because of the, the risks that visible light uh, pose to artworks. Um, and then additionally, you know, some artworks are much more sensitive to fading from visible light. You know, we've had we will have conservators at the conservation center who will encounter an artwork that is especially sensitive and they will strongly advise our client to not display, uh, not display that artwork. Um, there are uh, 
some workarounds with that um, where we will make, we will have an original artwork that we will house in a sealed package. And then that sealed package will go in a box or a, uh, a flat file or something and uh, in the dark, not be exposed to any visible light. And then what we would do is maybe uh, have a facsimile made of that artwork and uh, frame the facsimile for display. So that is one possible uh, work around with that, but um, there's no glazing that uh, can prevent damage from visible light, unfortunately. Additionally, uh, UV coatings do deteriorate over time as they become exposed to UV light. Um, so conservatively, uh, they should be replaced every 15 years. Um, some manufacturers will give it longer than that, but conservatively, I would say 15 years, every 15 years, these uh, UV filtering acrylic glazing should be replaced. Um, speaking of uh, different levels of UV filtering, uh, here we have a graph uh, that compares the light wavelengths that are tr transmitted through different kinds of glazing. Um, so we can really quickly here kind of take a look at this. Um, line A is an unfiltered, uh, standard unfiltered glass. So you can see quite a bit of UV radiation uh, is transmitted through that standard glass. Uh, B, line B is a UV filtering glass and C is a UV filtering acrylic. So you can see that uh, there is much less transmitted UV radiation, um, but then when we get to visible radiation, they all, uh, um, of course, as, as part of their function, you know, most visible radiation still occurs. We have line D that is the uh, ideal UV filter in which no UV radiation and all visible radiation is uh, is transmitted. Um, you can also see here um, that there is a slight uh, blockage of visible radiation, which means that there is a little bit of distortion that happens with any glazing, but it's uh, you know very minimal. Um, and there are different different coatings on. Uh, UV filtering acrylic and glass to try to uh, lessen those. Um, but that is also a consideration. Uh, speaking a little bit more about acrylic versus glass. So um, acrylic is some of the benefits. It's lightweight, it's virtually shatterproof, uh, and is available in a variety of thicknesses and sizes. Um, so that makes it, um, especially useful for oversized, uh, framing oversized artworks and objects. Um, one downside to acrylic, however, is that it does have a slight permeability to water vapor. So when we're talking about a sealed package using UV filtering acrylic, which is what we use, it is not 100% impermeable. There is a slight permeability to water vapor to water vapor, so that is a consideration. Um, when we talk about glass, uh, the one of the main negatives, of course, is that it is very fragile. It can shatter and severely damage artwork. Uh, it is very difficult to transport safely. Um, I can't tell you the amount of times that we have seen artwork shipped with a glass glazing that did not make it safely <laughs> to their uh, destination. Um, it's also heavier than acrylic. Uh, so that kind of works in tandem with it being very fragile. Um, glass being heavy, um, it's often the case that a framed artwork framed with glass will fall off the wall uh, and then the glass shatters, then the artwork becomes uh, severely damaged. Um, it's also not suitable for large sizes. Uh, when 
uh, when you start getting into oversized pieces, you really uh, see um, acrylic being used more and more and more. Um, there is, uh, there does exist laminated UV filtering glass, which is basically two pieces of glass laminated together. Um, and that can be used for smaller things um, to create a highly sealed package, uh, which is impermeable by water vapor. This is another, uh, another type of sealed package that was developed by Hugh Phibbs at the uh, National Gallery. Um, but uh, so that is a possibility um, when thinking about artworks that are in, uh, in environments where the slight permeability to water vapor that acrylic uh, has is, uh, is an especially uh, uh, worrying uh, issue. All right, so moving on to creating the seal, which is sort of the last layer of the sealed package. Um, creating the seal is, uh, the seal is created by using marble seal uh, bonded to the edge of glazing with pressure sensitive tape and heat. Um, and so marble seal, marble seal is really the material that uh, makes the sealed package so unique. Um, it, Marble Seal is, uh, has a lot of industrial uses, um, military uses, it's used in food packaging. Um, you might have seen Marble Seal, uh, you'll see it in like uh, bags of Indian food a lot of times to those like bags that you boil Indian food in, uh, in that silver, those silver bags, that's Marble Seal, uh, a version of Marble Seal. Um, there's a lot of different versions of marble seal, um, but essentially it's a uh, aluminum and polyethylene laminate um, with an aluminum foil layer, polyethylene and nylon on the front and back, uh, traditionally in five layers total. Um, it's highly flexible and waterproof and puncture resistant. Um, it has two sides to it. The interior is kind of dull while the exterior is shiny. Um, and it will bond to itself with heat. Um, now, that's used sometimes in art handling or uh, in collections to, you can make a marble seal bag where uh, using heat, you can, you can bond the marble seal to itself and make a bag or, or you can line a crate with it, things like that. Um, to uh, make a seal for either storage or for, uh, for transport. Um, and the marble seal we use at uh, the Conservation Center, the specific uh, product is called Marble Seal 360. And it's called that uh, because the interior, the dull side of the marble seal, uh, um, melts and becomes activated at 360 degrees Fahrenheit. So uh, getting into the different steps that it takes uh, to build the sealed package. Um, what we do is uh, you'll have your, all the different layers that we just discussed, uh, the backing board, the back, the, the mounted object and the glazing, you know, perhaps, you know, a sink layer or some other, things like that, uh, neatly stacked uh, so that they're lined up with uh, a sheet of marble seal below that is, uh, you know, uh, may have three to five inches of extra material on each side. Um, and you see uh, she's getting ready to, uh, to do the ceiling. She's got her tacking iron by the side and she's lining up the, the materials and she's got the marble seal ready. Um, so the next step then is to attach uh, a pressure sensitive double-sided tape to the edges of the glazing. Um, generally we'll use, it's a 3M brand 415 tape we'll use for this. 
um, we'll use uh, tape as a quarter inch width. Um, and the edge of the, the thickness of the acrylic glazing is about one eighth of an inch. So we'll actually put it on that corner of the glazing and, uh, and burnish it down. Um, careful not to go beyond the glazing because we don't want that tape to come into contact with any of the, the mat board or whatever housing materials are underneath. Um, so there's essentially an eighth of an inch on the side and an eighth of an inch on the face of tape that's been burnished down. And then at that point, the next step is to then wrap the, uh, all those materials with the marble seal. Um, unfortunately, I can't really get into it too much today, but the, there's sort of a special uh, corner technique to make the corners folded nice and tightly and keep the, uh, keep the seal uh, intact. Um, but wrap with marble seal and then seal with heat. So you can see on the left, she is using a tacking iron just on the very edges where that tape is underneath uh, and going all the way around. Uh, and then on the right, you can see this is a marble seal that's been, uh, been uh, sealed with heat. You can see these little wrinkles in the marble seal that lets you know that the, the, uh, the adhesive has been act the adhesive and the tape and the marble seal has all been activated and the seal is uh, is is complete. Um, after that step, then uh, you trim the excess marble seal. So you can see on the at right, she's trimming the excess marble seal, and on left at the left there, you have the sort of the finished product of this sealed package, where you have a uh, nice neat about eighth inch strip of marble seal at the face. Uh, and then of course around the sides and back uh, is all marble seal. Um, so that's the basic sealed package and the way that it's constructed. Now there are some variations, some other types of packages uh, that we will make. Um, a double-sided package, I touched on a little bit uh, before. On the upper left is a frame double-sided package. Um, rather than the marble seal going around the back, the marble seal is just on the sides and you, and you have a acrylic glazing on the front and back of that package and uh, the marble seal is then trimmed on the front and back just like the regular package. Um, on the right here, we have a circuit, an oval uh, sealed package, an example of that. Um, you know, same principles again, but you know, in the, in the oval format. Uh, and then on the bottom here is a sealed package, with a frame sealed package uh, with tone spacers. Um, so again, when we talked about uh, one of the functions of the window mat is to provide a gap between the glazing and uh, and the artwork. Another way to achieve that is with spacers. Um, a lot of framers use spacers a lot. Oftentimes spacers are attached right in to the frame, right into the frame rabbit. Um, but with a, a sealed package, you can't do that because you have a, a, a seal uh, around all of the housing materials. Uh, so just to briefly go into uh, how we make our spacers at uh, CCHA, um, and specifically tone spacers. Uh, so the, our tone spacers, it's a, uh, they're built with inert acrylic tubing wrapped with one ply ragboard paper. Um, and that ragboard paper uh, can be painted with uh, acrylic wash. Uh, so it, it would be highly diluted acrylic paint uh, mixed with uh, deionized water um, and we'll uh, apply several layers of that to the one ply ragboard paper until we uh, achieve the same tone as the 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 artworks paper tone um, and then at that point we would attach the, those spacers around the backing board uh, this image at the top shows a, a a tone spacer that's been attached 
on the one side to a, uh, a hex amount panel backing board. Um, then on the bottom, we have uh, one of our 3D images here of kind of the breakdown of how a sealed package with tone spacers uh, would, would look, uh, or the cross section. So it gives you an idea of the different layers, but it's very similar to uh, a, um, a sealed package with a, a matted artwork, but instead of the, the mat, you see the, uh, the uh, acrylic spacers wrapped with ragboard paper uh, to, uh, to provide that depth. All right, and then the last step is framing. Um, so you can see here, we've got another 3D image of, uh, of the sealed package and the way that it fastens into a frame. This frame uh, is a wooden frame with a wooden strainer in the back. Um, but there are a few different ways to do that. So I'll just quickly get into that. Um, it's important to know also that a sealed package must be supported by a frame for exhibition. Um, otherwise, it's uh, to exhibit a sealed package or really even to store it vertically, um, the marble seal is really not uh, a strong enough material to withhold the weight of even uh, acrylic glazing and, and over time it will likely uh, likely fail. So as far as a display housing, a sealed package really does need a frame in order to, uh, to be displayed. Um, generally speaking, wood or metal frames are suitable. Um, I get asked about uh, frames a lot. Uh, people are concerned about uh, certain uh, materials or off gases from frames negatively affecting artwork. Um, with a sealed package, that's less of an issue uh, because you have, you have that layer of marble seal. You have the package uh, in its own microclimate environment is really separate from the frame, so it's not so much of an issue. But generally speaking, metal uh, and wooden frames are, are safe to use uh, in any, in any uh, sense, but uh, especially uh, with the sealed package. Um, so a few different ways. You can fasten the package into the frame with offset clips, uh, with mending plates, um, carefully inserted glazier points or pulled nails. Uh, I say carefully inserted for those because you do run the risk of, uh, of puncturing the marble seal with, with those. Uh, or a strainer, um, like we the previous image. Um, a strainer is especially useful for um, larger frames. Uh, what a strainer does, in addition to fastening to to function to fasten the uh, package into the frame, is it also provides structural support for a frame. I mean, you can see this image on the right here. This frame is a very thin frame for such a large piece, so. And the photo doesn't capture it, but behind that uh, sealed package, there's a strainer that then provides the structural support to keep that frame from torquing, uh, as well as the sealed package from torquing. So, because that is one way that uh, a frame can come apart and then also a sealed package can, uh, can fail, the, the, the seal can become uh, compromised. Um, so speaking of that, some of the vulnerabilities of the sealed package, um, like we talked about before, damage from visible light. Uh, as the sealed package is a display housing, does not protect against visible light. So that is, is something to be aware of. Additionally, uh, temperature. Um, the package will, the sealed package will, um, protect against rapid fluctuations in temperature. However, over time, it will acclimate to the temperature uh, of its surroundings. And so if, um, if you're talking about uh, a, an environment where the temperature really exceeds the uh, recommended uh, uh, range for objects on paper, um, it may not be sufficient to just protect your uh, your artwork with 
uh, sealed package and uh, more broad environmental controls are probably necessary at that point. And then the other uh, uh, major vulnerability of a sealed package is just poor handling, uh, either from uh, transportation or from hanging. Um, all of these things uh, can cause uh, the acrylic to crack, uh, the, uh, the package to be torqued and for the, the seal to break that way. Um, any sort of, or uh, hung poorly on the wall and it falls and causes breakage that way. So these are, all, these are some of the, uh, the vulnerabilities to be aware of. Um, in addition, uh, there are some times when uh, a sealed package uh, um, is inappropriate. Um, one, uh, one instance of that would be, uh, you know, artworks that contain a mix of unstable materials such as cellulose nitrate or PVC that can emit uh, critical amounts of volatile organic compounds, VOCs. Uh, the key here is critical amounts. Um, you know, VOCs uh, are, are everywhere to an extent. Um, so it, it may be that uh, uh, consulting with a, a, uh, a conservator would be necessary to determine uh, whether the artwork that you have contains a critical amount of these VOCs. Um, additionally, high tannin materials such as oak wood, um, sometimes we will encounter a, a artwork on paper that is then attached to a secondary wooden support. Um, generally, you don't want to seal those uh, in a sealed package either. Um, uh, also, mold damage items where uh, the mold remedi remediation was incomplete. Uh, so essentially, you have active mold. That would be another situation that you would not want to uh, to house the artwork in a sealed package. Um, also artworks that need to be frequently accessed uh, or maybe documents and things like that. Uh, artifacts that um, are uh, needed to be accessed like for scholarly reasons or, or perhaps a, a multi-page artwork or document that has information that you can't see through the sealed package. That would be another reason to, to uh, where it would be inappropriate perhaps. Um, and additionally, uh, when you're talking about collections of this, you know, if you have facility space limitations, um, generally speaking, a, uh, a sealed package is about five eighths of an inch deep. So, um, those storage considerations are uh, something to take into, uh, into consideration as well. Um, all right. Um, okay, so that uh, wraps up uh, my talk. Um, I'd like to uh, say thanks uh, firstly to Ben Elizada, who is my uh, colleague at CCHA in the housing department who uh, helped put this presentation together. Um, additionally, Ben Kirshner, uh, con uh, conservator at a CCHA, all these great uh, 3D sealed package images that you saw, he, uh, he created all of those uh, while uh, quarantining at home. So uh, thanks to him for that. And additionally, uh, I just wanted to make mention um, Major funding for uh, the Conservation Center, uh, our education programs and outreach is generously supported by uh, the William Penn Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Independence Foundation, the Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Council on the Arts, and uh, a special shout out to the Philadelphia Cultural Fund. Um, we, uh, we love the Philadelphia Cultural Fund and uh, we support them and we're so glad that they support us. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to now open up the Q&A here. 
Um, all right, it looks like <laughs> it looks like we've already got some uh, uh, questions here. Um, first one, did I mention that sealed packages can protect from water leaks, et cetera? Um, you know, I, I forgot to mention that, um, but that is, is something as well. Um, before my time at the Conservation Center, in fact, we did a study where we submerged uh, some uh, sealed packages in, in water. And I believe for, I wanna say 72 hours, there was no, uh, no water permeated. Um, and sort of anecdotally also, we had a client uh, a, a long while back, a client who we won't name, who uh, experienced flooding in a, uh, uh, due to Hurricane Sandy, and um, they had some framed artworks and sealed packages that they had to evacuate. And when they came back, um, those uh, sealed packages, the artworks were intact. Again, they began to leak a little bit of water, but uh, the sealed packages really saved uh, those, those artworks from being ruined. Uh, okay, um, next from Krista Williams. Uh, we have tinted UV filtering films on the windows in our changing gallery. Does the fact that they are tinted help with the longevity of the UV coatings or does it count against it? We went with tinted to help with visible light as well as UV light. Um, you know, unfortunately, I don't know a lot about those uh, window uh, UV filters. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't. <laughs> I wish I. I wish I had a better answer for you on that, but I really don't know enough about those uh, those coatings uh, to. To really give you an answer either way, and I'd hate to give you the wrong the wrong information. <laughs> uh, I'm getting some people saying thanks. Uh, thank you. I appreciate uh, I appreciate you uh, tuning in. I'm glad to be able to uh, to reach out. Um, Another question. Uh, I have an early FIBS model where he used clear, a clear acrylic based JLAR tape over the marble seal. Is there a reason why you prefer the double sided tape underneath the marble seal? Um, well, yeah, I'm aware of the JLAR uh, over the top of the, the marble seal, but um, my interactions with that was um, with the uh, the the JLR tape was used, but also the the double sided pressure sensitive tape underneath the the marble seal to create the seal, and then that JLR tape over the top was added as a, a kind of additional protective layer uh, to. Um, protect against punctures mainly. Um, as I understand it, and the marble seal that I've worked with will not seal to acrylic without that additional uh, double-sided pressure sensitive tape on the underside. Marble seal will only uh, adhere to itself without uh, an additional uh, adhesive. Uh, someone asks, can I use polyethylene as glazing factor? Um, it depends on uh, what you're using it for. I would say not for uh, framing. Um, and, you know, polyethylene will provide some protection as far as, you know, dust and uh, expectorates from people speaking or something like that, but is not going to uh, provide you with any of the UV filtering qualities or um, 
or anything like that. So um, I've never heard of uh, that being used uh, as, a, as a glazing for framed artworks. Um, someone asked, do you use the same design for artworks that will be stored in a freezer? Um, we don't do that, no. Um, I'm not aware of that. Uh, at the Conservation Center, we will uh, store things in a freezer. Uh, uh, artworks that come in that have active mold, um, we will we'll store in a freezer. Um, other than that, uh, we, uh, we don't do, don't store any sealed packages in the freezer, no. Um, someone is asking if uh, we can send the presentation uh, to them. Yes, I believe all of our webinars are available on the internet. Um, so we can certainly uh, make sure that you're aware of um, their locations. Absolutely, yes. Uh, also, we'll be doing any follow up to the presentation. Who knows what the future holds? Uh, unfortunately, this is our kind of our reality right now is uh, um, I don't know what's going to happen beyond the next two weeks. Uh, you know, one of the positive things to come out of this otherwise pretty horrible global uh, event is that we are able to do more outreach and uh, fulfill that part of our mission. Um, and so um, I guess I would say yes, but I'm not sure uh, when and in what capacity that, that will happen. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see. A diagram of the Marvel Seal Corner flanking. You know, that's a great idea. Uh, <laughs> um, so I would say that um, yes, I would like to I would like to do that for you folks, but check back in maybe because at this time I don't I unfortunately don't have a good diagram of that. Um, I've done workshops uh, where I uh, uh, show people how to do it, but unfortunately no real uh, diagrams at this point. Does the sealed package cost a lot more than regular framing? Um, the sealed, the, the portion of the cost that uh, is associated specifically with the sealed package is actually pretty minimal. Um, uh, is a is is a small part of the cost. So um, no, it does not cost a lot more than regular framing. Um, I guess it depends on the uh, your definition of regular framing. Um, if if you're talking about uh, you know finding the most inexpensive framing possible. Uh, that's a different thing, but but generally no. The, I I guess the short answer is no. It, it does not cost a lot more. <laughs> um, the supplier list someone's asking about. I I believe we will uh, um, be sending out some links that do include some uh, some suppliers. So yes, uh, we will have. Does the change in temperature affect, oh, shoot, I lost it. Uh, does the change in temperature affect the relative humidity inside the package? Um, generally speaking, uh, no, um, I believe, uh, 
over time, it will it will begin to. Um, Um, sorry, I'm reading here. Uh, are you familiar with Alan Miller's method of creating marble seal packages for panel paintings? He utilizes a tape seal on the inside and outside of marble seal strips to attach to the acrylic. Yes, uh, I am aware of that. Um, uh, since we're a paper lab, we don't generally deal uh, with paintings. Um, I am aware of that package is a little, uh, um, my understanding is it's built that way because uh, the, the sealed package design as, uh, as I was just showing you folks um, would require uh, there to be direct heat up against the side of the painting and that's not, that's, really not an advisable thing to do with a painting. So um, those packages are, you, yeah, you sort of attach the marble seal to the face of the glazing and then around the sides of the frame, insert the, uh, the painting into the uh, uh, frame with the marble seal around it and then sort of seal it up uh, on the back. Yes, I am. I have works on animal parchment scraps that buckle and change due to relative humidity. Would a sealed package help mitigate this behavior? Yes. Uh, um, short answer is yes. Uh, we do quite a bit of uh, work with parchment documents. Um, the only issue would be if, if those uh, parchments are already quite, uh, uh, buckled or, or cockled or whatever, um, you know, the sealed package isn't going to magically make them flatten out. So there might need to be some flattening that happens first. Um, we, uh, there's also special mounting techniques for parchments, but generally speaking, yes, a uh, uh, sealed package is, is a, uh, a good house, very good housing for parchments to keep them from, uh, to keep them flat, basically. <laughs> if works on paper are stored in their frames vertically, is the sealed package still an advantage? Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, it, the frame gives support for that sealed package. When I was speaking about storing uh, sealed packages vertically, um, being an issue, I was talking about a, an unframed sealed package, but yes, uh, when it's framed, absolutely. Um, how are we doing on time here, folks? Uh, Leah, are we good? Can we keep going? What do you think? Or Ben? <laughs> We can continue, says Leah. All right, thank you. Uh, um, if you, someone is asking, if you use coroplast for the backing board, can you just use marble seal on the edges rather than the whole back? Um, I've never done this. Uh, you know, just thinking about it now, I don't see why not. Um, it would just be a little uh, more work. Marble steel itself as a, as a material is, is pretty inexpensive. Um, but, uh, you know, without, uh, you know, without thinking about it too hard, it sounds like that would be okay. But, uh, you know, um, because I, I haven't done it myself, I think maybe some testing would be required to make sure that uh, I'm not overlooking an issue. Ah, uh, yes. So Ben Kirshner uh, uh, just chimed in to uh, help me out with this RH and temperature question. 
Uh, RH and temperature are codependent. Any change in temperature will also affect the RH, but the mat board can buffer the fluctuations in RH quite well. So, um, so over time, uh, it would be an issue, but uh, minor fluctuations, no, but major fluctuations would, uh, would become an issue. Can you do something like this with three-dimensional objects? Um, yeah, as I mentioned before, uh, uh, marble ceiling, you know, creating a uh, microclimate environment for three-dimensional objects is, uh, is used a lot um, for transportation. Um, but yes, uh, I suppose you could marble seal, you could make a sealed package with the vitrine as well. Um, again, that's not uh, really my area of ex expertise, but, um, but I, I think that it could, uh, that could be a possibility, yes. All right, um, well, unless there's any more questions, um, I, think, uh, I think we're going to uh, call it quits. Thanks again, everybody, for attending. Um, uh, thanks for my colleagues for uh, chiming in and helping out. Um, yeah, thanks everybody. Stay safe and uh, yeah, hope to see you again soon, either on the uh, on the internet or uh, maybe in person one day soon. So yeah, all right, be well, everyone. <laughs>